Hey guys, welcome to my video on the care of thyroid. I'm going to start out by reminding you to please subscribe today for instant notifications of my future uploads. So I'm going to start out with an overview of how parathyroid hormone works and where it works. So parathyroid hormone is secreted by the parathyroid gland and it binds to parathyroid hormone receptors on two main sites, the nephron and bone. In the nephron, PTH has different actions depending on location. So there are two basic locations. One is a proximal tubule. In the proximal tubule, PTH inhibits phosphate reabsorption and also helps hydroxylate or activate vitamin D. So the way I remember this is that P in proximal tubule is for pushes out phosphate and the X in proximal helps me remember that hydroxylation of vitamin D occurs here. Collecting tubule, ascending loop of Henle, and distal tubule make up the second location in which PTH acts to reabsorb calcium. And I remember this by thinking of it as a calcium dam. So the C stands for collecting tubule, the A stands for ascending loop of Henle, and the D stands for distal tubule. PTH acts on the bone by stimulating osteoclast proliferation, which increases breakdown of bone, thereby increasing serum calcium and phosphate. Remember that activated vitamin D absorbs calcium from the small intestine. In normal homeostasis, a negative feedback exists where excessive serum calcium causes the parathyroid gland to secrete less parathyroid hormone. And this happens because of things called calcium sensing receptors. And I'm going to talk about this more towards the end of the video. But when we talk about primary hyperparathyroidism, the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism is parathyroid adenoma. And a parathyroid adenoma causes there to be excess PTH. Parathyroid adenomas can be part of MEN1 or MEN2A. The laboratory profile of a primary hyperparathyroidism is elevated PTH, elevated serum calcium, and decreased serum phosphate. Now, the decreased serum phosphate is not intuitive to some people. And what you need to remember is that the PTH effect on phosphate excretion is more profound than the effect of PTH on serum phosphate through osteoclast activity so that overall you have a decrease in serum phosphate when you have too much PTH. Another thing of note is squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. So there's perineoplastic syndrome that consists of hypercalcemia because squamous cell carcinoma secretes PTHRP or parathyroid hormone related peptide. One thing to remember is that there is a PTHRP assay that can help you determine whether the hypercalcemia and the hypophosphatemia is indeed due to a suspected perineoplastic syndrome. Hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is a familial disorder that is very high yield. It is caused by defective calcium sensing receptors in the nephron in parathyroid. These receptors are defective because they have lost their sensitivity to calcium. So, in the nephron, since the CAR receptors are not working properly, there is an accumulation of calcium in the serum. And 
the response of the parathyroid to the increased serum calcium is also impaired because those receptors in the parathyroid are defective as well. And so you have an inappropriately normal to high parathyroid hormone, even with an elevated calcium. Clinically, hypocalceric hypercalcemia can range from incidental finding to a severe life-threatening condition. And incidental means like maybe the patient is going in for some pre-op lab work and it shows up that they have these abnormal values but they're they don't have any symptoms severe life-threatening condition could be severe hypercalcemia and the lab findings can be borderline normal or identical to a primary hyperparathyroidism so what that means is an elevated PTH, elevated serum calcium, and decreased serum phosphate. The only way to diagnose primary hyperparathyroidism versus hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is to look at the urine chloride. Secondary hyperparathyroidism. The most common cause is chronic kidney failure. And in that, there is a decrease in calcium due to vitamin D deficiency. The kidney is failing and vitamin D in its active form is not being formed. There's also an increase in serum phosphate because it's not being excreted. So you have hyperphosphatemia. And the excess phosphate in the serum also chelates calcium. The parathyroid gland is going to secrete more PTH in response because it senses that there is low calcium, but it doesn't really help. So the net effect is an elevated PTH, a depressed serum calcium, and an elevated serum phosphate. And ideally, you want to treat the underlying condition, which is the kidney failure, through dialysis. So it should resolve and the PTH should go back to normal, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's when we get something called a tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So again, as a prerequisite for tertiary hyperparathyroidism, you need to have a secondary hyperparathyroidism for which treatment was given. So the usual cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism is kidney failure. So if the patient was treated through dialysis, but the hypertrophy of the parathyroid or the hyperparathyroidism persists, that is tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And in the lab profile, of a tertiary hyperparathyroidism, you're gonna have the high PTH, you're gonna have the high calcium. The phosphate is variable, but in a tertiary hyperparathyroidism, the PTH and calcium levels are elevated just like they are in primary hyperparathyroidism. So thanks for watching my video. I'm gonna have a video on hypoparathyroidism coming up soon. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.